Ah. Wow, astonishing. New glasses, oh. Yes. Well, they're not new, I got them in, in the Netherlands, but uh, I have to keep swapping between my reading glasses and these progressives. And so it takes me a while to adjust. All right. <laughs> cool. So how things More the Lennon style. Mm. Mm. Well, this is my old style, actually. This is, I used to have glasses like this for years and years, more than maybe 30 years, until about 2013. And then I had my LASIK operation, so I didn't have to wear any glasses. Uh, but then, you know, they've gradually deteriorated, so I've had to sort of go back to, to glasses. Well, they aren't nearly as thick as they used to be. Oh, cool. Yeah, how are you all? Oh, so good well, to I see asked, you. I asked you first, uh, how's it going? <laughs> it's all right. It's autumn. <laughs> That's a fantastic thing. <laughs> oh, it's all right. Yeah. Um, um, Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a I know. I'm, a, I'm, I'm definitely <laughs> underwhelmed at the moment, for sure. Oh. I, yeah. <laughs> but uh, nothing's nothing's bad. <laughs> so, how about you? What's the outlook with the new glasses? Is that what I need? Glasses with a better outlook. <laughs> well, yes. Some, some rose colored glasses. Yes. I think, I think that's what uh, most people wear, isn't it? I think you know, at least 90% of people wear rose colored glasses in oh. order to get through that. So, <laughs> um, I'm missing out. <laughs> What's it been like since you've been back then, Gary? Oh, um, well, I, I, sh I won't get started. Uh, an awful lot, a lot of few bad things, yeah, quite, yeah a few bad things happened. Um, oh, and gosh. there's still some very um, yeah, uh, unpredictable, uncertain issues. Um, but there is one piece of good news. I managed to sell my apartment at last, my, my apartment in Jakarta. I've been trying to sell for a couple of years. Um, and so that, that I guess is one thing out of, out of the way. At least I've got some money now. So, so yeah, but, but apart from that, I'm still working to get out. You know, just uh, because, um, well, I'm organizing my one of my daughter's um, Australian passport so she can go and live with her sisters in Melbourne. And that's uh, a major, major problem um, at, the, at the moment, just because uh, the, the way the Australian embassy is not working at the moment. Um, and it hasn't been for about two years. But yeah, what, where was I? Yeah. But yeah, once that's out of the way, I've, I've got to sort of try and find another country. So. <laughs> Yeah, you still think you can't stay there long term? No, it's just uh, there's just too many things happening, and I, I, you know, there's too many hungry bureaucrats and hungry uh, rentiers out there um, who, will, who will say and do anything to 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 um, uh, extort. That, that's basically the capitalist game in, in Indonesia is all about um, extortion. You know, who does it best? So it's a rentier economy. And when pressure, when, the, when economic pressures come on, you know, the, the, you know, the, the kraken is released and uh, they, they, go, they go a bit wild. Ridiculous place in the bureaucracy. But where's your likely next uh, 
country? Uh, it's very difficult to say. Um, Can I you mean, go back to Australia? I, Is that an option? I, oh, I could, but I, I would die of boredom. So um, it, that's an option. So, um, but yeah, I, I just be, yeah, I just can't really see myself being there. It's just such a strange sort of place. I mean, even when I, even when I left it, I thought it was a strange place. Um, so, which is one of the reasons I left. Uh, but going back and you know, um, in Melbourne, for example, uh, although I'm not originally from Melbourne, that's where all my daughters are. Um, or, well, I don't know. It's just uh, the culture there just doesn't really do anything for. Uh, I find it, you know, rising, dead, unthinking, conformist, and uh, overall quite oppressive. Not much different to here, really. So, <laughs> no. so yeah, I'll stay in there. I, I might go with my daughter for a few months um, just to get her settled in. She needs it. Um, uh, but, you know, she'll be taken care of anyway. Well, the daughters will do that. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the, the other alternatives are you know somewhere in other other country in Southeast Asia, you know, you know or or Europe. Um, and I really can't. I'm sort of running out of countries, you know, or, or places that I feel safe in. That's what I'm. You know, there's really not a lot of places like like. Hmm. So I just have to see what happens. <laughs> so what have you been up to, Rupert? Uh, yeah, Rupert, yeah. How are you? I, I'm fine, I'm fine. Uh, I've uh, been sailing a couple of times and uh, more of my wood carving. Um, and a uh, bit of gardening. No, it's been quite relaxing. Um, no, no great stress, no great fears of uh, uh, lack of safety here. So, so. Uh, yeah, I'm sort of signing up to a few things and trying to get a bit more involved. I'm going to do my first life drawing for a while on this weekend and as an art project I'm going to get involved in so this is it's quite nice so, so feel sort of that Hastings is a really nice place it's a very attractive um, town and more so than I think I'd imagined on lots of levels I mean both physically and uh, with the with the people, I went to a went to a couple of do's recently and met quite a lot of people. And there's um, it's it's sort of it's quite um, invigorating. There's quite a lot of interesting things going on. I, it's it, I'm just fortunate to be in this position where I don't have to work in order to enjoy things. I can I can just get involved in things without having to worry too much. Um, or at all, really. Oh, it's 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 quite nice. It's quite nice. I'm I'm looking forward to getting more sort of heavily involved in different artistic enterprises. Cool. How what about the sailing? How 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 does, how did that go? It's okay. I've just been uh, crewing really because I'm not allowed to use the. The boats in the club yet because we have to have an induction and because it's winter now there's no opportunity to do that so it's sort of but I've, there's a the guy who is it's, it's a all volunteers this club and the guy who's the sort of chief executive to call him, he's known as the commodore and he uh, he's been taking me out in his two-hander 
so I've either been crewing or the last time we weren't racing so I was the helm and uh, but I I just <laughs> it keeps trying to persuade me I've got to race and I think oh I will I'm, I'm fine I'll do that because it makes you better sailor but I just enjoy being on the sea really it, it's Hastings from the sea is well not from the sea is quite attractive but from the sea it looks lovely and I the weather um, here is quite dramatic at times and so you get extraordinary big skies and the texture of the water is very variable and it's lovely and sometimes it's very calm and you get extraordinary reflections on the water and sometimes it's a bit rougher and it looks like it's much more exciting so yeah i mean i'm i'm just <laughs> you, enjoying it you'd be a lousy sailor just say, <laughs> oh look at the texture of the water over yeah. there well, I think I, I, <laughs> whilst missing the boy <laughs> yeah i'm afraid I, i'm rather more <laughs> that is, I am a lousy sailor, yeah. No, no, racer. <laughs> racer, yeah. yeah. Well, I don't, that's the problem. I'm not going to be, I'm not really interested um, in, I, you know, that just, it doesn't excite or interest me in going around, trying to go around faster than other people. It seems a bit weird, uh, particularly because I weigh there more. Is a, there, there is a clear difference between yachties who, who race and, and yachties who just cruise. A, yeah, well, I, I had the experience of uh, when I bought down my boat from Hong Kong, I just happened to get um, an Olympian sailor, this woman who was in part of the Olympic, Australian Olympic team. And God, she, she was just awful, absolutely awful. She so just sort of, you know, it was just, she just could not relax. Everything had to be fast, 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 move, move, move. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was just, it was chaos just listening to her. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we weren't those sort of sailors, you know. We're just, we just want to get to where we want to go and uh, we, we'll just take it easy. Finally, she dropped down <laughs> and uh, we had to take it down with only three, three of us. Um, so, yeah, and she was quite unbearable. But just a completely different <laughs> attitude to sailing. <laughs> there is that. I, I, I think there is. There's two I different think, types, maybe is. more, but there's at least those two different kinds. The ones, well, isn't that interesting? If we can make, a, I was thinking that this morning, and every, so much on the news now, on the radio about um, climate change and all that. It's they're seeing everything as a commodity. Mm -hmm. Hello. Oh, hello, hello, hello. It's just you can't hear that. Yeah, when water is just a surface on which to go fast on, that's when it starts to go weird, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. but we can do that with anything. And, and it's just, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's difficult. I mean, I quite I like the idea of being able to get the boat in trim, you know, to, so that it does it works at its most efficient. I mean, that appeals to the sort of designer. I mean, that, so you twist this way, twist that way, get the sails right, and but it's the bit about going fastest around the course that you know I don't. I'm not. I just getting the boat sailing properly is a good idea i mean i think that's so that's sensible um because obviously like anything it works when it works well it works better and it can feel more attuned but i just think it's just the nature of being on in a wilderness because I mean, earth there aren't many places on the earth where it's a, an entirely unmanufactured environment. I mean, probably nowhere in Britain it's, it doesn't have the hands of people on it and there aren't many places in the world. But as soon as you go on the sea, you're in an unmanufactured environment. You're oh, you say that well. Yeah. I always try to express that, but unmanufactured is good. Yeah, I like well, it's, that. It's just, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, 
it's, it's as natural as you're getting and getting it and, mm. and you, you can do it very quickly mm. so you're you're the control of the ground is <laughs> is out, out of your hands and so you you are thrown into a different position rather than being able to control the the ground you're on it is up to you to live with the fluctuations of what your what's being thrown at you and i, I mean i just think that that's a, a an interesting reversal because you are, there's nothing you can do to make the sea firmer, harder, or easy. You can't do anything about the wind. You can't slow it down, speed it up. Like all of the things that you can do that we're used to doing on land, we're used to being on land, to being in a position of control and, and changing things to suit ourselves. Whereas it's the other way around. We have to adapt and we can't control uh, the immediate environment and I, it's a uh, that and the fact that it looks amazing is uh, it's, it's it's for me is what it's about going fast around little orange inflatable things is now not <laughs> but not such an interesting uh, uh, thought because I think probably when you're doing that you, you're losing the sense of why you're there and, and, and what it's about maybe I don't know because I I'm done it yet, so. but I, I think we'll probably buy a two-hander if my children and their partners do what they say they're going to do and uh, join and get interested. Then uh, I think it would be quite nice to go sailing with them, so they can they can run it and I can just sit at the front, and look out. Yeah, good idea. Cool. Yeah. We were in one race, and the, the, the we are on a, a taser, which is a, just a boat. Takes two people, we've got two sails, and there was another boat racing the same race called a Buzz, uh, which had a spinnaker and a trapeze. And whilst it was supposed to be not quite as fast a boat, it was going much faster than we were. I think that's because they had a, we had this disadvantage of having a heavy chap in it, whereas they had a very lightweight crew. It was the, the wife of the guy. And uh, and she was hanging out on this trapeze at the side, and that just looked great. And I could imagine my kids loving that. So I think something with a trapeze on it would be good, good fun. If, if they like sport. swimming, that is. Oh. <laughs> Well, do you often fall out then if you're on a trapeze? <laughs> a, a trapeze boat, a little two two man trapeze boat, is by its essence tippy. Right. It it will go over uh, easily by its nature. It has to right. because it can only then the trapeze is the is the hint. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it had you know it, you know that it has so much sail on it that it can only be balanced out and kept from capsizing by uh, changing your point of gravity outwards. That's the whole point of a trapeze. And if you don't do that, or if you're not good enough and fast enough on it, then that won't work. There's too much sail on that boat. Right. And um, so if you want something that you can, you, you will not watch the sea on that one. Um, you won't. But, so I, I would say, you know, because it's it's just uh, you, you, you learn other things like being really connected connected to the movement of the boat and and if, how far you have to be out and further forward, further backward. And it, it's a dance. A, tra a tra trapeze boat is like a dance. You know, you, you both parties shimmy their body weight around all the time because every little wind change or strength of wind ha ha must have immediate effect on your body weight and where you place it. 
otherwise you go over you know <laughs> you just fly yeah, okay. you know <laughs> and it and that is just that won't ever change and it when people do it well it looks so stable and so easy and uh, that's because they do it very well so if you want a boat where at times you can even just go out on your own and watch the sea and do a drawing by a wayfarer a wayfarer yeah something you know a, a, a proper boat you know that hasn't got too much sail so that you can or the, the whole family can sit inside it's amazingly spacious actually you can get a lot of people in but you can also sail it on your own very very nicely all right. There's something like that, an old design that has no trapeze on it. You know, it's all what you want. If you want that fun, you can you, you cannot just quietly um, sail on a trapeze boat. That is very unusual, I would say, you know, because and other other than it's there's hardly any wind at all. Then yeah. you then yeah, but not with when when there's. The wind is any anything like normal. You will have to work at staying upright. Right. Well, it sounds the kids would probably love it, but perhaps not for me. So. Yeah. <laughs> what about a, a, a catamaran? Because that was uh, another option. There's, there's quite a few twin hold boats in our um, in the boathouse, and they they seem to be very stable. And they have this nice uh, tarpaulin thing between them, so you can lay things out. And, uh, and we, there was something with two very young kids on uh, in the same, I don't know whether that race, but one of the races. And they was, you know, it seemed to be fine, so you could have. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that. They, they, they don't capsize, it's not that easily. That is very rare. So you can keep them upright much, much easier. Yeah. So that might be good fun. They don't point as well. You know, mm -hmm. They usually, they, they, they don't have a center board. No. Well, I wouldn't have for them. They, they, exactly. <laughs> so so they, they tend to go, they, they have more, um, uh, they, they go sideways more. And they and they, they, they don't yeah. point as far as, you know, they don't cut through the water and point to the boy as usually, but they can be very fast still. So they make good for that by being very fast often. It can be really good fun. A little cat is, is really good fun. Yeah. 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 Well, I presume because they're, the, they're just both racing. Mm. They're going up. Now it's an it's an underground boathouse, so it's it's obviously limited in space. So that's very long. It runs underneath the promenade, and so it's a sort of it's a way wide promenade that has boats down both sides. So the all the boats are about four meters long, I suppose. Maybe four, maybe five. I don't know. I doubt. It's sort of probably not an angle. So I guess that they're all about. The same. They must be as small as uh, as small as catamaran can be, and they're all pulled out on trailers and things. So. Mm, mm. Best would be to go, to hang around and go and try lots of different ones. You know, be mm. be crew to people. Um, usually, they're looking for crew, um, and um, and that would be a really good way of finding out if you like that movement. It's a different motion, different movement on the water. Well, that's uh, true. I mean, if you're looking for that feeling of flow and uh, connection with the ocean, then perhaps a catamaran or even a small catamaran might may not quite be the same feel. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm more bothered, bothered really about sort of you know the fact that I'm being there. I'm not. Uh, it's quite nice to make a boat trip, but it's not that isn't the, my main criteria. Mm -hmm. sort of being on the sea, but it, I if we're going to and obviously, I want to do something where the kids are going to want to be involved. So I need to find something which is uh, that they that they like. Yeah, they yeah, like that would be cool. Hmm. But because we've now got a grandchild, I mean, maybe a cashman is the would be an option. Anyway, we'll see. See, they have, they've been my 
Go or or something like you know a stable, reasonable sized boat like a wayfarer. That, wayfarer that's a yeah. family boat, you know. That right. uh, anyone can have fun with that. Very very safe. Can you uh, can you race a wayfarer? Uh, what? Uh, can you? Can you race a wayfarer? Race race, race it. Race? race? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Very uh, you won't hang racing. out, you know, you will be in your own handicap, which is a wayfarer, you know, hasn't got that much sail up, is therefore quite stable. Um, it won't be the fastest boat in the race, but you can race against, you know, you either have a handicap, which takes that into account. And if you're a good sailor, you can win the race, even, you know, you take half an hour longer because of this handicap system. Or there's enough other wayfarers in the club that does the racing that you you can, you know, you race against your other wayfarers. Yeah. You can see what, what the others have, you know, that's also a good clue. What works well in the waters where you are, you know, what have people bought there? So what are there lots about and who races them? How young and agile are they? <laughs> you know? It's mainly lasers that people race. And, mm. um, that's the most popular boat. Yeah, we had a laser too. We had that that two-man laser, a bit bigger, uh, with well, trapeze only, and... These are only uh, one-man one, one laser. Yeah, they are the most popular. I think the laser people. two never, never quite had the same... No, didn't have the same popularity. We were always the only ones who had one. But, you know, you get disco legs on that because you just, you know, they have to, that's one of these boats that only stay upright if some, in any wind, you know, if someone is out there hanging right. over the side, but really, yeah. And it's very fast, you know, you have to have fast reactions <laughs> because otherwise you'd be too late <laughs> and to go in the drink. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, well, I think uh, and that uh, I think in our the, the club, I don't know much about it, but the, it's the single handed is definitely more popular. There's mm. only two or three people who yeah. stay on the double handed. But I'm, 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 yeah, I don't want something that I'm, I'm going to have to work out all the time. And, uh, and I, Pretty sure I'll, there'll be enough people for me to be able to share a boat with. So I think we'll probably go double under. I'll have a look into what a Wayfarer looks like. I'm not sure there's any of those in the club. Anyway, that's me. That's what. Mm. Sort of. <clears throat> what about you, Alfie? How's your. Well, we tried to fry a boat and fail, fail oh. failing miserably <laughs> because it is. <laughs> Not a good market for it at the moment, but we'll we'll get it somehow. There's not a good market, I thought. People not. No, there's no boats. Basically, they're all being snapped up. Um, and we're all, we're all parked in, in Indonesia. <laughs> yes. Mm. There's a whole marina full of boats in my marina, and they're all for sale because the owners can't get, get back into Indonesia. How and amazing! Or sort of, you know, the past one and a half years or whatever, two years. So there's a, quite a few boats for sale. Uh -huh. You've got to get them, get here first. <laughs> and then you've got to sail it back. And then you've got to sail it yeah, back. <laughs> bit of a trip. <laughs> I heard about pirates too. <laughs> and, well, that, that's, yeah, very bad. But, uh, yeah, how long would it take? You know, it might take three months. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> you're, you're not going across some very poor waters. <laughs> no. Oh my I God. Like that, mm -hmm. that is a bit too much for me. Good business, though. Send them over. Organize it. There's really no boat yeah. in, in Britain uh, to, you know, to, yeah. But they will well, come on the market again, I'm sure, because. Uh, they have been bought by people, you know, staycation people, and um, and then uh, the, and then it is quite expensive to keep a boat in Britain. is very expensive. You've got to find a place to have it, which costs you dear money. And and um, 
and then you might find that you don't use it that much because actually the rest of the family is not so keen as as is usually one who is keen and the others kind of put up with it for a while in, in uh, big yacht uh, sailing is yeah. it a, a keel boat that you're yeah you're well we would actually ideally like a lifting keel we want we want it all you know we want both worlds we want to go you know have have a um, a keel that that is good to go over to France and stuff. But um, we we also really love exploring up rivers and then just finding somewhere where you can. And and on the south coast, there's a lot of places that you cannot get in with a keel yacht because it, they don't have the depth of water. Right. Uh, so little little harbors all along. They are so lovely. And if you have a lifting keel boat, you can just crank it up and just kind of get into those little har um, harbors or, or um, river mouths. It's really cool. We know that because we go with our friends who have a cat. So they also have very shallow draft, a cat and can dry out and you go up the Hellford River and just dry out on the mud on, in some little creek there. And it's just absolutely fantastic. You know, that is so cool. And, um, and then you, it's just you and, and that little mm, nook in the river with the wildlife and it's slowly getting dark. I mean, it's heavenly. It's, it's one of my favorite things. And, um, or, you know, any of the little rivers will do that really. And it's just you and the birds and the, 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 the sounds they make. And you, basically you end up in places that otherwise you have to be an absolute millionaire to, to be there because you, the, you, the only thing you might see is, is one amazing villa on the, on the land, you know, with in, in the middle of its grounds that cost about 10 million pounds <laughs> so that's the only people you share it with and and but it's it's free you can well they might still get you and charge you 20 quid but um it it's it's available you may be there you can it's allowed you, know, you have permission and that is again like you say very rare in a such a highly developed country like britain that you have freedom like that. You can end up in a magical place that you could never otherwise stay in. You know, there is no road, there is no, uh, and, and you, have, you wouldn't have the money to, to own anything like that. Right, so what sort of catamaran have your friends got? What sort? Yeah. Oh, they, they, it's a, um, it's, um, um, about 11 meter cat. Oh, funny, I think that. Yeah. And yeah, now you, you can live on it. You can, it has four double cabins, really. It's, it's, yeah. Um, that's the, the you, so you go on a journey and you, you take in those, you know, go from, from beach to beach in a way. Right? go out to the Sillies and just drive it up a sandy beach there and think you are on the Treasure Island. <laughs> it's really quite cool. You can do similar with, you know, you can't quite drive it on a beach. Like you could, you could dry out on a lifting keel yacht, but you might be a bit skilled with. Um, oh, right. Well, maybe they, that's for the future. Right? Well, that might be, you, you might go into yachting in good time if you really like the sailing, absolutely. So we haven't found a boat, but we're looking and we talk to lots of yacht brokers and that's a hoot if you're in the right frame of mind. It can also be very annoying and they all talk with great, um, uh, uh, such um, uh, professionality and they have gleaming offices and um, you know so how much money have you oh that's not very much <laughs> <laughs> and, and then yeah. you talk to one you're very impressed about how much it's embarrassing. They know. <laughs> and uh, and then um, you talk to three and you notice 
that they all tell you something completely different, completely about this, about the, the nature of these boats and what they're good at and what they're not good at and what's worth having and what's not having. And you notice it's not knowledge, it's just opinion. I just, it, incredible, but the, I don't come across people like that all that often, I guess, you know, who with such confidence just give you their opinion and uh, make it out as if it were real um, expertise. It's a bit like estate agents. Yeah, I guess that's the only thing. I'm also, also dealing with estate agents at the moment. And they really, they are shysters. <laughs> In Birmingham, they are. <laughs> they just lie. <laughs> well, they, uh, the interesting thing about estate agents is that they have no qualification other than being able to be a salesperson. But they yeah. know nothing about the, uh, properties at all. They I mean, do not. <laughs> no, and, and they don't need to. It's there's no requirement of them to have any knowledge at all about what it is that they're selling, which is sort of a little odd. But it does sound a bit like your your boat brokers. Uh, bit, boat uh, brokers yeah. have no need for any qualification. Right. Same thing. They just in there for you know getting the commission, basically. I think yeah, they well I know. So they are. Maybe they are a dying race because uh, the internet does it very well now. I was going to say, do you not just buy some on eBay? You know, it, it. Exactly, you can find those. Then they still, they are, you know, they still handling all that. But sooner or later, people will cut out the middleman and good riddance, I can say <laughs> at the moment, because I just feel that they do. In they, they just. Um, well, I don't know. Maybe they have their role. There's some are brokers for for the big yacht uh, building companies, and they have swatches of different, you know, um, upholstery materials on on their desks. You know, would you like it like the, your your two hundred and fifty thousand pound yacht with a geometric pattern or a flowery one? So like, you know, it's like. Maybe that, you know, they then like, I, I don't know what, what their role is. But as, as a punter, if you come along and you say, okay, can you advise us what would be a good boat for us? Forget it. I mean, that's just the wrong question for them. Absolutely wrong. It, 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 it might come better when we say, okay, you got a boat we like. Can you just proceed this, the, the sale, basically? That's, I think that they might be. A bit better at that, but at advice giving, they are just really <laughs> totally hopeless. <laughs> and you know that when they start with, well, I sailed a da da da, and I wasn't very happy with it, and then uh, immediately I said, okay, so that's just your personal experience. It's interesting to up to a point, but you have you have formed your opinion, and now it's your expertise. But it's very narrow. It's very, you know, it's not. How much do you know about other boats? Not necessarily. So anyway, so <clears throat> we haven't found one yet. You know, that sort, of, that sort of arrogance. That that sort of um, arrogance in in the yachting world. It's not just confined to the brokers. You also get it with you know. Uh, 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 if, you, if you look through through any of the forums, the yachting forums, you often get these people sort of self-appointed experts on everything, um, and and there seems to be a very common phenomenon. There's not, you know, not that they're all like, but just there just seems to be a phenomenon where 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 yachtsmen sort of think they're taking on a godlike status because of what of what they know, uh, and generally, you know. Some do know something, but others maybe not so much. But, but it seems to be a thing in yachting, um, where maybe it's a sort of combination of money and uh, and sort of uh, um, you know and skills that you need to actually you know operate a boat. But uh, yeah, there seems to be a degree of arrogance in, in some some parts of that world. I actually set up a, a company. 
<laughs> As you uh, do. Two, two years ago, uh, uh, the biggest, the biggest, the biggest boat broker in Southeast Asia or or East Asia, by the way, um, and I set up a branch here in Indonesia. And I was actually director for a while. Uh, but, but anyway, it's just a, a fanciful world. I mean, I mean, certainly they sell boats, and I actually bought my boat from their, from their lot in Hong Kong. Uh, but but not that I wanted to, but there was no other choice. They had a monopoly. So, uh, but the thing is, that they're just not interested in these small boats, small second-hand boats that commission for nothing. Uh, they're selling the big boats, you know, the, what they call yachts that don't have sails, you know, that those big motors, monstrosities that sort of, um, God knows what people do with. They're huge, what, I think they call them super yachts, that sort of category of, of you know, so you look at about uh, 50, 50 foot, 60 foot, or even more, much more. Uh, very, very large, expensive boats worth millions and millions of dollars. Um, they're, they're the sorts of things that they're interested in. Uh, they get one, one good sale from uh, a, 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 a boat like that, and then they've made heaps of money. And of course, they're always associated with these sorts of people. You know, they're, they're associated with the, these you know, super rich um, people who sort of, you know, want everything, uh, rather arrogant, they sort of take on all those attributes as well. So by the time they start dealing with you, you know, you're just some, you know, some, some little pauper with uh, only, uh, <laughs> only, a few, only a few hundred grand, is that all you've got? I mean, really? <laughs> Why don't you go back and save up? Well, I have actually, and that's all I've got. <laughs> just don't take you seriously if you're not talking about millions of dollars. It's just a bit of a sideshow. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a real yeah a bit of a a look into another world. I'm I'm completely I'm bowled up by I'm listening to a book at the moment from yeah. by Michael Sandel about the curse of meritocracy I think it's called or something like that and and it's just oh it it, it um it really is bowling me over what the arc that he did and how he how he explains um how uh, a principle which sounds at the first quite good ha has has had the most devastating effects on societies and um i i just um you know it's one of these books where you think everyone needs to read this so that we can change the world together and and be a, a more just world and a, a, a saner world because this is insane and the way that we're doing it and no one even notices and and i'm interested because even it it goes even it it does the big political thing where go where it, it really causes havoc and great inequality um, in society. But uh, I see it when I work with individuals, as is my job, um, uh, suffering from the same madness, really, of um, of comparing oneself and, and uh, having um, harsh judgments about one's kind of performance. Uh, so this this uh, principle of meritocracy uh, has has gone from the big into the really microscopic, where every individual might suffer very personally from that kind of attitude. And it's, I'm, I'm just really um, mm. ast uh, just bowled over by it, really astonished and um, yeah, and and then um, you meet these people, and I can. Uh, part of me is like, you just, uh, you know, can have a very harsh judgment of of them, and part of me can look at them and say, you're completely tied up in your world, and I can see you struggling to make it in it, and you you you. You have lost all sense of proportion of what's 
you know, like in the money world or so. It's quite right what you say, Gary. They, they then associate themselves with all these people who have so much more money than them. But, but it's both attractive and devastating, isn't it? To, because, and, and actually, again, this mint principle of meritocracy is then on a very personal level, devastating, because clearly these rich guys that you're dealing with every day, well, they made it because they have merits that you don't have because otherwise you would have as much money as they and you don't. So you're a loser. And they have to balance that all the time. You can actually at times really see their pain in their gleaming offices. Mm-hmm. So it's, 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 it's a very interesting um, encounter. But they, they look at the look that they have for you, who, uh, you know, what is for us enormous amount of money that we can spend on it. Yeah. For them is zero, you know, <laughs> yeah. how do you even come into my shiny office? Yes. You yeah. know? <laughs> but yeah. but you can see the look of disdain in a way sometimes mm-hmm. because you haven't got enough money. So you, you haven't got the merit because otherwise you would have. You're a loser too. But so are they. And it's just like, ooh, it's a very quite at times, well, it can be very interesting and very unpleasant, actually. <laughs> What's the author? Uh, Michael Sandel. He is um, he's a philosopher, one of these rare creatures nowadays. And he is an amazing philosopher. He does a lot of work in Britain. And he, uh, you can probably find him on BBC Sounds uh, because he did this series of programs where he, with Socratic questioning, gets a, an audience in a pub or something, that's pre-pandemic, uh, to discuss really difficult questions philosophical questions. So he doesn't, he doesn't ever um, say what he thinks, but he asks such clever questions. He's, he's an, a master in, in it, in this, so where, where he works a whole audience towards coming to a very sophisticated, um, uh, you know, when they start out with just opinions and then he leads them to a much more sophisticated appraisal of what is to be discussed just by doing this questioning. It's, it's fascinating how he does it. So it. There's a book called The Tyranny of Merit. The Tyranny, that's it. Yeah, oh, sorry, okay. got it. That's all right, that's all right, I've got it. I shall get it, I shall get it. Yeah, I'd be interested oh. if you feel like yeah, uh, no, it, sounds, what you think of it. Because yeah. I, I, um, I think he's spot on, actually, yeah. I, I remember reading about something, a, a critique of meritocracy, probably going back last century, actually. Uh, what sort I of think arguments? he mentioned someone who did that, yes. Yes, who, yes. Yeah. I forget the name of it. Uh, but, but anyway, I think, I don't remember, but uh, I, I do have a vague recollection that there was amongst other things, uh, this relationship between a so-called meritocracy and, uh, and, and, the, and a stratified middle class. Uh, basically, the, the, the middle class basically completely you know, uh, defining what meritocracy actually was and therefore self-perpetuating the, 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 the class system through, through the system of meritocracy. Yeah, I think that was one of the arguments. Anyway. It's interesting that he said, you know, the word uh, he mentions, Sarah, maybe that's the person you read, he mentions two early economists, and one was a, a, a liberal, even uh, so, um, socialist one who was very much for the mer- meritocracy, because, you know, it would lead to equality, which it absolutely doesn't, but on, and never mind that, would he believe that all. And then a, a very right-wing economist who, who um, you know, was uh, very, you know, you could say um, would have, um, yeah, have a big interest in the status quo. And he clearly, very clearly describe what would happen with meritocracy and, and what a disaster it kind of could 
uh, come up with. And it was just counterintuitive that actually socialists in their, um, in, in their endeavor uh, overlook the, the dangers of it. Whereas it, is, it seems to be clearer to people who are on the right wing and would, uh, don't have a problem with class systems in the first place as much. They just see that that is just a new one way of, of perpetuating class system, I guess. You know, it's like, uh, it's like the Labour Party in the, in the late 90s and then, you know, with Blair yeah. uh, really... Um, uh, riding on meritocracy yeah. thing and actually uh, setting the foundations for ever more inequality in society. So going completely, mm -hmm. making it 10 times worse whilst spouting that they would love the, the, you know, everything to get more equal and actually achieving quite the opposite. So it's, it's very interesting and kind of like very heavy. Maybe that's why I'm so heavy at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, oh God, where's yeah. the hope? <laughs> Another yeah, problem. That, <laughs> well, that is an issue, isn't it? Because you know, I, I do a lot of reading or, or listening uh, to, to audio books and things like that. And I'm just wondering how much, you know, I can only take so many critiques of the negative. I mean, so and to the extent, well, you know, I can sort of say, well, yeah, I know what the problem is. We all know what the problem is. You know, all I'm getting is sort of, you know, um, critiques of problems, which, which, you know, don't actually help, I don't think. You, know, you can all say, well, we need to recognize the problem and how to fix it, that's fine. Um, but you know, the, the harder part of that is the, the creative part, of it, and that, and that cre which is a solution, yeah. which is oh. much, much more difficult. <laughs> Very much, nice. much more difficult. But, you know, yes. You know, mm. when, when you sort of start to be creative, you know, you've got to put yourself out there, open to attack, and um, you know, it might be a lousy idea or it might sort of have serious flaws. You know, Nobody's putting out books where they sort of outline, you know, this is the solution or this is a solution um, to, you know, because I'll just get cut down. You know, it will not be a bestseller because people don't want to read, you know, or generally people are less likely to want to read those sorts of something. Um, whereas critiques of the negative are very popular. Um, uh, but, you know, mm -hmm. you know, books sort of offering solutions or, and, you know, there are very few of them. There are a few. Um, uh, one that comes to mind, for example, is uh, Donut Economics. Um, Say again? Say again? Uh, um, donut Economics. Donut? I'll try, yeah, I'll just try and find the... Economics. Keep forgetting that. Sounds interesting. <laughs> hey, that's my next book. <laughs> Jean I shall smile well, again. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I've, I've heard of this. Yeah, no it's Kate, Kate Raworth. Yeah. I think she's right. a, a, from Oxford, I think. Kate? Donut economics. Seven ways to Whoops. think like it. Oh, that was her. Uh, right. So I've, I've come across this book. I haven't read it, yeah. but... Oh, I, I would recommend. I it. heard of the I donut thing. I, I heard of of donut, yeah, thing, but donut I didn't know it was. And, yeah, but it's, yeah. A, it's a book. They've actually also got a course. They've been sort of hounding me to sort of do this course. Uh, they, they only just started one um, uh, was about six months ago, and they, they sort of their marketing department was sort of pushing me to sort of um, uh, be part of it. But, you know, I just didn't have time. I, I certainly actually would have done it. I had the time, but I simply didn't. But, but now they're still trying to get me to go on the second one, you know, whatever. But, but you know, certainly I think it's very interesting and, and very promising. Um, uh, I think the, the city of Amsterdam, coincidentally, um, is, has embraced this, this concept of uh, you know, a, a circular economy and, and donut economics. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see you know, how far they go with it and whether any other uh, uh, significant country actually embraces it and tries to adopt it. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that, that's just one example of a book that offers a solution. There are not very many out there. 
the great, the great proportion are basically you know, either looking at known facts or, or they're just they're not they're never extrapolating beyond what what is known or what has already happened. They never go past that and say, okay, what is the, the trajectory? Uh, you know, where where does this uh, this uh, where where should this lead us? For example, so mm -hmm. you know, putting out solution books is sort of you know, or, or books are offering solutions of some sort. Um, they're just not not as popular. You know, but you know, there are a few exceptions, very few. In the main, I think we prefer to read about negative things because it's, I guess, it reinforces our <laughs> negative, negative um, outlets in some way. Uh, and like, I, I've never understood why, you know, you get all these books writ written by people about the Trump administration, for example, and how, how absolutely and utterly awful it is. And you think, well, you know, I already knew that before he was even president. Why do I need read, to read yet another book <laughs> telling me that? <laughs> and I mean, there's dozens and dozens of them. I, you know, I don't need to be told how bad it is. It was quite, it was quite, quite clear before he was even elected how bad he was. So, mm. so yeah. The, the, mm. I get you, I get you, but but in in this case, I must say, I didn't know, I didn't know it as explicit as as. Uh, Sandel pointed out there. I, I didn't know. I, I kind of because it's so, it's one of these principles that are so seeped into uh, society here that um, it, it, you have to learn to question it. I do, you know. I, I, it, it sounds such a good principle, you know, that everyone should, you know, it, it, it and most people buy it. So I'm in. I, I I know what you're saying, and and uh, there is that you know. At the same time, I I'm glad for this one. I I do, and and, and as you say, you you much ahead, uh, um, and and you're an economics guy. So for you, that is not such news, but um, for me to see it in this new light, and have um, more uh, uh, um, background. To even on an individual level, you know, when when people feel so heavy with this kind of uh, demand on them, it goes very personal. Your personal success in life and how you um, how you measure that, basically, um, and and what you take as as touchstones there. That, that it fascinates me that it really goes into the very personal like that. And and I feel that I have gained from uh, exposing myself to all that like doom and gloom in a way, you know. But but I'm I'm glad to to know more about it because it it affects people very personally. And I didn't have the language or the the um, principles before to even really um, uh, to to take that on basically. You know, even as a, um, uh, in hopefully, better, better Socratic way for someone, uh, rather than saying no, no, that's where you go wrong. But you know, is that really how we would, uh, how you would like to um, uh, um, measure yourself? You know, with this or that, and then having that background. But I, I do totally agree with you. That is. It is easier to criticize what is rather than, yeah. So, hey, thank you for that, um, for, for that idea of the book. I will, I will yeah. report back. Well, I've got lots of other book recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I've been, for some reason, um, what's his, I can't think of people's names anymore. Um, there's, Certain German philosophers, which I've been sort of doing a bit of reading about, and uh, um, what's his name? I've got such a poor memory. What's that, that, that German guy? Um, he was sort of 18th, 19th century um, before Nietzsche. Uh, before Nietzsche, that was Kant. Such, Kant and yeah, after Hegel, Kant. after Hegel, um, yeah, after, after Hegel, 
um, 18th century. Oh. Don't think, heck. Uh, <laughs> uh, wish, I wish I could remember things. 18th century, before Nietzsche. Yes, yes. Nietzsche often, often referred to him, I think. Um, I'll just I'll just see if I can find find it. Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer. Um, Kierkegaard. It was, no, but he's not German. Um, um, no, I'm not, I can't come up with any other. Yeah, yeah well, any, anyway, I've just, I've just been sort of doing, uh, well, probably past uh, three weeks or so, I've been sort of reading and listening and uh, watching material on it. And it's, it's, it seems to, have, it seems you know, remarkably close to, 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 to my whole approach. I mean, it's, 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 I guess, very stark and materialistic and uh, devoid of, of hope in most ways. And, 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 and in some ways, it, it, it's, it's basically, one, one of these, these things he's he basically saying is that, you know, people without religion do not have uh, hope. And uh, I, I, I do disagree with that a little bit, but I can sort of see why he would see that. Um, but anyway, on, on to the, yeah, well, that, that's just you know, one German philosopher who I've been able to put up with. Uh, so that I've been simultaneously trying to, trying to re-listen to this book on uh, Heidegger. And I just don't get it. I really don't want to read some of No, no idea. And I, I, don't, I really don't understand well, maybe it's just his language or his terminology and, or, or just terminology that I just cannot sort of attach to or, or visualize. Um, so, but yeah, I, I found Schopenhauer to be quite interesting, very interesting from, from a Dharmic perspective. But he actually often refers to the Stoics. Um, it resonates uh, quite strongly with, with, with uh, uh, what perhaps we would understand it as you know, uh, dynamic understandings. Um, so you know, I, I found that uh, useful, uh, really. And I'm surprised that more people haven't really um, mentioned it. Um, you know, perhaps, there's, I don't know, perhaps there's something I don't know. You know perhaps, perhaps there's some fatal flaw in his thinking that I, have, you know, that I don't know about. But it, it seems, seems to be you know, I've, I've quite, um, from what I've read and so far, you know, he seems to be very, very close to, to expressing you know, a dharmic sort of outlook. Who? Oh, so we think, don't know his name. Schopenhauer. Oh, Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer. Oh, right. right. I've got it. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. So, uh, actually, I forget where I was going to go with that. Um, anyway, <laughs> there was a point to that, but I've forgotten. So. No, well, no, well. How is your creative course going, Rupert? I cannot access. I I tried and, and via the the Google um, thing to the um, oh, right. to to uh, see those videos and I, I ju they, they're just not on my machine. Now I'm I'm really not very good with um, with that platform, but I see the documents and the folders, but not the, the videos. And I don't know if they're not there or if it's just me not being able to. to... I'll, I'll have a look after this and see if I can. Find Could out. you see if 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 you have them on the platform? That would be nice. They, would yeah, they work. See. They they seem to work. Um, when did you check last? Yesterday. Uh, 
and I have access to the, the to the big, you know, on, um, and then it it um, mentions the, the um, recordings. So there's a there's a folder for it, but it's empty, and I don't know if I'm doing something wrong. Very possible. Um, I see, but I find the other documents. I can access them. Right. They're there. That's strange. If you can find the other ones. So I don't, but surely someone else would have said something if they if they weren't there. So I I might be doing something wrong. Oh, anyway, right. that's why I'm not the wiser. But uh, right. yeah. Well, if, yeah, that's strange. But it works for you, yeah. You find it well. Well, I haven't checked recently, so I don't know. No, no. It... The, the 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 discussions in themselves, they you find it interesting and. Um, yes, I think so. Um, it's been a while since the last one, and I, I, I because of, because there's a long time between them, it's uh, it's difficult to know, get a sense of direction. Um, and I sort of thought that maybe something like that would emerge as a consensus, but I, it doesn't appear to be. Um, and that, so I think last time I was saying, well, if we will meet a couple of times before the end of the year, so when it's like November, December, and then review in the new year to see whether there is a continuity to see if, if there's a sort of sense of direction. Um, but at the moment, there's I've got you know it's some, there's some ideas that have emerged for me, but I'm not sure that whether they have any traction for anybody else. That's I think that's the, and I sort of assumed that there would be a consensus that we would be that would emerge. But, you know, but, but I don't know. There's nothing yet. But it's difficult to know because there's not much conversation. There's not much conversation on the forum. There's not much conversation in, uh, other than once a month or so. Um, so I don't know. It's difficult to tell it's at this stage as to whether there's what, what the value is. I mean, I say so, sort of like a personal value. And that, one thing I've noticed is this, the idea of, of um, uh, imagination, because there's this, you know, the, there's this thing about creativity and imagination, similarities and dissimilarities. And I don't think they're the same thing, but I have been wondering about the nature of, of self and imagination. So for instance, you can't, I can't see how you could have self. You can't have a personal identity without imagination. Because that is, it is in your imagination where the self occurs. I think I can't see anywhere else that the self exists other than in imagination. At the very fact that it's called your imagination, so it's like, well, it belongs to something, and so it belongs to a person, and that person is a self. And yet, the self is obviously an element of duality, and is, to that extent, imaginary. It's it's not imaginary. That's a bad word. Uh, it's talking about imagination. It's uh, is illusory because there is there is no. Duality. We know that there isn't a separate. So if there's no duality, and yet there is a self in imagination, does that suggest that it is the imagination which, in a way, has created self? So then I thought, well, can you have imagination without self? So for, for instance, if you're dreaming, that's you've still got imagination. 
But normally when you dream, when I dream, you're in it. You're in the dream. That is to say, the self is in the dream. But sometimes in a dream, this is, I'm trying to think about my own dreams, that, that you're not the, the center of it. But on the other hand, it must be you that's looking at the dream. So the self still must, must still exist. Even though the dream might not be focused on self, you still have to have self in order for to be the point of imagination. So are there elements of imagination which don't involve self? Now that, so then I was thinking things like mathematics or creativity, the, the incubation period of, of creativity or when you're doing something like mathematics or when you're doing something like logic then that processing, that intellectual processing, still uses imagination, but doesn't involve, or doesn't have to involve self. In fact, self gets in the way. So if you're going to do a, if you're going to do some looking at numbers and trying to work out where the numbers and what they all mean, then you, if you're thinking about self, that distracts. And the same with creativity. You put self in, it distracts from the process. But they do still need a, a space for those things to happen, which I guess is imagination. But it's not the same as the imagination where you're talking to yourself or you're thinking about things in general or you're, or you're dreaming or, or whatever, or you're wondering what to do next. Because all of those things, when you use the word you, means that self is involved. So I just, I'm now thinking that perhaps there's this, what we call imagination is in fact a space, one of which the normal, perhaps the more run of the mill one is where you have the self involved and that is self and imagination. And then there's another space where you can get rid of self and you get rid of those elements of imagination and they are the more I don't know what the word would be, but without self. And they're different, they're, they feel different. And meditation, I think, is the same, because in meditation, where you're just looking and you get rid of the self element, then that is not also that space or part of that space without the self being. Anyway, so then I was thinking, well, what does that mean? And so I was thinking about animals or whatever. So you had a dog, and in the dog's space, where the dog doesn't think of has doesn't have a self, presumably. Um, but then, what sort of space is there? Does the dog use imagination? I've no idea because I just don't know enough about the nature of dogs. Brains. But then, so it's, it gets curious for me the, the relationship between self and imagination. I don't know why I got started on this, but it's just something I've been thinking about. And that, that was a thing that came out of the creativity business because it, it's, it seems to relate these things or, or have these elements of creativity as one type of thinking space, imagination, and then self. And I and the more I thought about it, the more self and imagination became a one thing. If you took one away, the other wouldn't exist. You took imagination away, self doesn't exist. You take self away, that element of imagination doesn't exist. So what about, if, uh, I mean, if you imagine the self being what the imagination reflects or what the imagination imagines it sees i mean it, it still means there's no self but the, the, the self in this case is the imagination imagining the self well i suppose um if they imagine who is involved in this imagining your imagination well if it's yours then it, then it must be a self 
because it was your imagination. Does that mean to? It must be a self. Well, well, well the, yeah, but that self is, is is only can only be imagined. Well, that, that's what I'm suggesting is that the self and imagination might be the same thing. That it isn't. There aren't. That there isn't a space called imagination which exists outside of the concept of self. So self and imagination are actually the same thing. So but wouldn't the imagination construct this self? I think that it would seem from this, looking at it from a, um, a Darwinian perspective, then the self and imagination emerged as you had imagined, as you had, as imagination emerged, so self emerged. And that, because you have to have a space for self. And that space to me seems synonymous with imagination. When I thought about it, it seemed the same thing as imagination. So self and imagination together create, you know, change things because it is possible for you to think about the future. And when you, but, but it means you, and that you is self. Mm. Imagination without self can't, it seems to me, can't predict, think of the future, can't think of future outcomes. Because who's doing the thinking? Who's doing the imagining of the future? The dog, we, we had a cat and the cat was very ill and was dying. And then I, you know, I, you saw, oh God, poor cat is dying. And you think, well, but well, actually, the cat has no concept of dying. Cat there, not there. It's not, doesn't think about the future. It doesn't think, oh, I'm, it thinks I'm, you know, I'm in pain. But there are all, it, there is pain. Pain exists, unpleasant. But it doesn't think this is leading to something else. That only we do that. We think, well, not only, I mean, there might be other animals, I don't know. But the concept is we are aware of the future. We, we, and predict the future, but that involves both imagination and self because something's got to be doing the imagining. So that's what made me think that can you have imagination without self? And it didn't seem to make sense. And then that makes yeah. sense to me. Ah, well, well, that's the thing. That's the bit that I couldn't work out. Where, how is it that you have imagination without self? Well, now, well, you know, I could be wrong in this thinking, of course, but I, when I sort of think of it's more know, likely I'm wrong. Know, let's face it. Well, well, you know, if the imagination is constructing itself, it's basically creating something. It's a creation of the imagination, so it is not really real. Only, only real in as much as it's in somehow being constructed within your imagination. So to say that that imagination is not real, I mean, is it or isn't it? It doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, I've got no problem with people saying, you know, there is no self, I mean, there's only imagination, for example, uh, because at that level, the, the, the self is just what is imagined by the imagination. So is, is, the, is what is imagined by the imagination real? Does it exist? Well, it depends what you mean by real, but it doesn't, of course, it doesn't exist as a, as a physical identity. So, so the question then is, where does a, imagination exist without self? In what, what are the processes? Where does that I happen? think within, within the, pro, I think within the processes of flow that exists, because you yes. forget self. Well, that's what I was saying about where you're just saying doing something like mathematics mm -hmm. or doing like something like creativity. In those circumstances, there isn't self. Mm -hmm. Now, is that space where that's happening the same as imagination? I, I would tend to think so. I would. I wouldn't attri attribute anything to self. No, not not in those circumstances. No, that's why I'm saying. That's why I, I, I tend to I'm tending to think that that's a different type of 
space than imagination space where mm. where you sort of think oh you know you imagine things i'm just saying the word you you know you imagine things then that that in those circumstances i can't see a difference between self and and imagination but yes the space that's why i was trying to think where where is this but I, i'm not sure that like when you're doing some maths and you don't have self i'm not sure that that space is the same has the same quality of what we would normally refer to as imagination it's very difficult because obviously when you think about you have to define like all of these things what do we mean by imagination but for me it's it seemed to be that imagination and self would like two sides of the same thing but there wasn't actually a thing called imagination and a thing called self they seem to be the same they seem to be intertwined and is in not separable they couldn't exist without each other anyway that's just for me, there is a, a confusion in there. If you say what self is, if for me, I can understand where you're coming from totally when self is the clearing, you know, that that ent- that 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 horizon of of our um of the, of an in of this individual um you know in a Heideggerian sense, the clearing. That is, if that is self, this this unique entity to which things you know that interact in is in the world, then that makes complete sense for me. That um, imagination is a, a quality of that self. It is absolute. It comes with it as it must come with it, just like meaning making comes. It's it's it's, it's an essential um, qualia of of it so uh, what is self if it is not meaning making and maybe also what is self if it's not ima- hasn't got imagination so it both recognizes makes meaning of things and imagines the world that's the way that it interacts and makes a world that is self but then sometimes uh, there seems to come in the egoic structure which self maybe imagines you know so um that then then and and so this discrepancy between what you say mathematics or 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 art or um one's oneself comes in um if the, or or being in flow if you're in flow self does the imagining uh, without any egoic input, but you can be in your egoic um, structure within the self. So uh, I always see it like the self is this clearing that that's in which everything happens. And one of the things that pops up at times is the egoic structure. So that that is not self. That's an a, a, that is a yeah, it's it's the ego. It's Elfie. Elfie thought of that. So that egoic structure claims certain mm-hmm. items that pop up in the clearing as mine, my imagination, my creativity, my meaning making. But it's actually, I mean, the whole idea of, of looking into Heidegger or into the Dharma is to kind of step out of that a bit, isn't it? So that we say, no, that is that just is. It's not mine uh, or anything. It's just is, and it. But it happens to be in this entity, which could be called self. Um, and so the imagining happens there. And if it's not claimed, we call it flow. Um, and the meaning making is effortless. Leslie always making there and makes it a self in the in the first place. So that's how we know that there is a a thing like a human thing, uh, because it makes meaning and it is imaginative. And the imaginativeness, I think, I mean, Heidegger never mentioned that word much, I think, but I think it is what he described as, you know, that it is absolutely necessary for it to call 
a human entity that it has a stance on itself. It imagines itself all the time. And that for me is imagination indeed in this, oh, I could have, you know, I could um, uh, dress myself as a hippie or I could dress myself as a, a power woman and um, then uh, everything will come, you know, so that's my imagination. That's, uh, that, those are options. And then life will flow a certain way. That's, that's part of uh, how things will go, you know, will I float through life or make lots of money or whatever. Um, and, and, but so this, these are imaginative taking, uh, taking us very, very, they are existential, he, he says, because they are so totally linked with it. There is self is only self because it makes meaning and it is imagination or it, it, it imagines itself. That uh, so, and, and then it your way of expressing that self and imagination is the same makes sense to me. But sometimes you you bring in another part of self, which sounds to me like ego. But if you call that self as well, then it gets confusing for me. Well, that's it. I mean, it is. It, it's I I can see what you're saying, and that. The flow, creativity, maths, whatever, those things which don't involve a sense of what I would say, a sense of self, you're saying is still self because something is happening somewhere. Yeah. And so you're distinguishing between ego and self. And I think, and I was you know, thinking of in a similar way the word ego though i mean that's our problem with all of these words is that ego can mean different things um, yeah they're all different difficult words aren't they're, they're they they're difficult words and it's a it's a it's a conceptual thing about the nature of self and what i'm suggesting what i think is that there are times when there is not the duality of a thing a human thing that that there is experience. Mm. And when there is the experience, there is no self. There is experience. And at that, at that stage, that something, it's, it is something, it is experience, but it is experience without self. Now, if you're saying, which is quite reasonable, that actually something is having the experience, I'm not sure I'm, I'm about that. I think it might be that the experience exists. Ooh. Well, that that is a that's a, 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 an interesting. You know, that's a that's that one big leap uh, where they say you know that's what what they call it. It's something in the um, uh, in the research of consciousness. Where, where, where there would be an argument like that. Consciousness just is, that is the primary thing. And then we split up into the, you know, all these different entities, but there is something that exists as consciousness. 